blessing to be with you guys today. I'm Ted. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. We are starting a new series. We're going to be in 1 Timothy, if you want to open your Bibles there. And I want to invite you to open to 1 Timothy chapter 3, um, because as I start this, we are, we're going to jump into what is the key verse of the book of 1 Timothy, and that's found in uh, chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 14 and 15 today. Title of our series is called The House of the Lord, and we are looking at God's design uh, for the local church. Um, and uh, so, good place for us to start here, New Year. What is God's plan and purpose for us, uh, the church here, uh, uh, and uh, the local church set here in uh, Temecula? And so, we're going to be looking uh, at that. Um, First Timothy uh, is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to a young pastor. This is a, ge- a kid that he had trained and that he deployed. And he deployed him to the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a place, had maybe as many as a couple hundred thousand residents uh, in the city of Ephesus, so a little bit bigger than uh, than Temecula. Um, And uh, as a people, uh, the people of Ephesus were very spiritual. And I'm not talking spiritual like, you know, Christian spiritual. I'm talking Hollywood kind of spiritual, right? And uh, and so they worshiped literally dozens of gods. Um, They didn't know Jesus. Uh, They were lost in their sin. And so Paul went there uh, as a missionary pastor, as a church planting pastor. Pastor, we're going to dig more into that next week and kind of look at uh, Paul's calling and, and uh, ministry and all. But <clears throat> Paul went there to to minister to this lost uh, to this lost city, and uh, so he he spent two years there, which is one of the longest seasons of time that Paul actually spent as a missionary church planting pastor. Uh, Two years was a very long time for Paul, but it was the same kind of model that he would follow. He would go into an area, he'd preach the gospel, um, and then people would come to know the Lord, and then he would build up a church, and he would train up local leaders within that church, and he would appoint people to different leadership positions. And then once he got that church up and running, off he'd be. He'd go on to to the next work, and he'd do the same thing over and over and over again. So Paul spent a couple of years in Ephesus, and... um, um, he, he then trained up and he sent Timothy, uh, as was his custom, to shepherd this local church that he had planted in Ephesus. And so the big idea of the book is what we're going to look at today in 1 Timothy uh, 3.15. We'll pick it up in context in verse 14. But what we're looking at is how the local church is supposed to function. This is the big idea of the entire book. So uh, let's look together. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Paul says to Timothy, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So we're going to unpack the, uh, verse 15 today. We'll uh, get into the rest of the, the epistle in the coming weeks. There's a lot to see um, in First and Second Timothy. Um, here in First Timothy, we're going to look at what our priorities should be uh, as a church. We're going to look at things like what are the biblical roles of men and women within the church? Uh, what qualifies people for leadership within the church? Um, how do we handle money in the church? How do we handle alcohol and power as Christians, you know, kind of some, some relevant things, like how are we supposed to handle alcohol and how are we supposed to handle, you know, power and, and, and all of that. But we begin here with a big E uh, of why, big E on the I chart of why this is important to you and me. Um, you guys need to know that, and this is our first point, if you take notes, you can write it down. God designed the church to operate in a specific way for a specific purpose. God designed the church to operate in a specific way for, for a specific purpose. In other words, the church is not a free-for-all. It's not a you do what, what you like at this place and they do what they like at that place. God has a specific design and a specific purpose for how we are all supposed to function. Paul says it this way. He says to Timothy, if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself 
in the house of God. You see, after Jesus was resurrected uh, and immediately preceding his ascent into heaven, Jesus commissioned his disciples. And his commissioning to them was that, hey, you need to take the gospel, you need to take it throughout the entire earth. And, uh, and here's how the way he phrased it, Acts chapter one, verse eight. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so then what happened, if you'll recall there, as you read through the book of Acts, is, is the, the Lord, he told his disciples, look, wait in Jerusalem for the gift of my Holy Spirit, right? He, he trained them for three and a half years, but he said, you need the power of the Holy Spirit of God to, to, to come upon you and empower you for this work of, of proclamation and church planting that I've called you to do. And so he poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and the disciples then began to fulfill his prophetic command. They took the gospel throughout Jerusalem. Uh, they then traveled beyond Jerusalem to Judea. They then took the gospel further out to Samaria, and ultimately they took the gospel to the ends of the earth. And along the way, what they did was they raised up leaders and they planted churches. They raised up leaders and they planted churches. This is a key critical thing. This is, by the way, the, one of the big strings on our guitar here at Reliance Church, that, that God has called us to raise up leaders and to plant churches. And we take that, that, that call very seriously. As a matter of fact, in the coming weeks, we're going to tell you about Bible college that we are starting this year. Um, strategically and specifically to raise up church planters both nationally and internationally. And uh, you can look forward to that. It's gonna be, gonna be an awesome uh, thing that God has called us to do and, and we're, we're gonna be pulling the trigger on that here shortly. So uh, raising up leaders, planting churches. Why did they focus on this? Because God established and ordained the local church as the primary vehicle through which he works. Let me say that again. God established and ordained the local church as the primary vehicle through which he works. It's been said that nothing on earth has greater potential to change lives and carry out God's kingdom work than the local church. Uh, Andy Stanley said this. He said that Jesus is the hope of the world and the local church is the vehicle of expressing that hope to the world. Now, when I say the local church, what I don't want you to hear is a corporate entity. I don't want you to think, you know, uh, local church like, you know, oh, that's, that's the, you know, the brand and the corporate structure of, no, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a committed family community. This is, when we talk about local church, it's a committed family community of which you are a part, right? Uh, Paul, speaking to the Corinthians, he said, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. That phrase, you are, in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it's a plural indicative, and the idea is that the church is all of us together, right? It's not some corporate entity, it's family. And, and a family is all of the members of that family working together. This is the place where each person is loved, this is the per place where every person is valued. Uh, this, is, this is that place where uh, the lost are welcomed with, with doors and arms wide open. This is what the church is supposed to be, right? A place where people can come and find healing and find hope. Um, and, and I love what the 19th century cleric, James Augie uh, said. He said, the church is not a select circle of perfect People. Aren't you grateful for that? Because I ain't perfect. You're not perfect. Ain't none of us perfect. It's not a select circle of perfect people. It's a home where the outcast may come in. Uh, it's not a palace with gate attendants and guards along the entranceway holding strangers off at arm's length, but rather it's a hospital where brokenhearted may be healed and where all the weary and troubled may find rest and take counsel together. 
That's the local church, right? We're not inviting you to our perfect club. We're inviting you to our family. Come on in. This is family. And most people would agree with that statement. When you talk about church, most people would say, oh yeah, that's what the local church is supposed to be about. Absolutely. But here's the problem. The problem is that's not what every church is. And maybe you've experienced that. That, Not every church is that. And it all starts, if we want to be that, being the local church that, that functions in that way, it all starts with what the church is built upon, right? Our, our foundation, right? We got, we got to know what are our foundation and what are our pillars. Who remembers the pothead partiers from your high school and college days? Who can remember those pothead part? Maybe you, who here was the pothead partier from your college and high school days, right? Um, we, Brenda and I, we went to her, her 20 year uh, high school reunion. Um, and uh, this, is, this is like 40 years ago. I don't know. It was a long time ago, right? So, so we went to her 20 year high school reunion, and it was the only reunion that we ever went to. This was enough for us. We went to that one. We're like, yeah, we're not going to reunions anymore. That, was, that, that wasn't so good. But this dude showed up. It was part of her graduating class. We'll call him Chuck, okay? That's not his name. Uh, we're protecting the name of the pothead. But uh, at any rate, so Chuck shows up, nothing had changed in Chuck's life, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure Chuck rode his Strand Cruiser to the event um, and he was dressed uh, like he just came from the beach. Um, and uh, this dude, he's unemployed, he's still living with his parents, still just living to party. And um, metaphorically speaking, uh, Chuck's approach to life was the same as some people's approach to church. Um, that rather than building on a solid foundation and rather than seeking out and engaging in in a healthy community, a place where he could grow and mature, that wasn't the kind of place, that wasn't the kind of community that Chuck wanted, wasn't the kind of community he wanted to develop, certainly wasn't the kind of community that he wanted to be in, right? Chuck had his own agenda, all right, you think about, you know, the agenda of Chuck's school. Chuck's school, you know, they had a different agenda for Chuck, right? And Chuck had, Chuck in his school, Chuck in all of life, had, they had different needs, right? Uh, the, the healthy communities that were available to Chuck, their agenda was, we want to see you grow. We want to see you mature. We want to see you become all you can be, right? And Chuck's agenda was, I want to I get stoned and I want to party, right? They had different needs. You need me to get mature, I need to get high, right? And so th- this, was, this was how it all worked out. And metaphorically speaking, there are people that approach church this way. It's like, you know, you, you find the community that you're looking for, right? And Billy Graham, he spoke about how this kind of dynamic happens in churches. He said, many churches of all persuasions are hiring research agencies to poll neighborhoods. They're asking what kind of church they prefer. And then the local church designs themselves to fit the desires of the people. And and in the process, Graham said, true faith in God that depends, or rather that demands selflessness is being replaced by trendy religion that serves the selfish, right? In other words, people are consumers, they're not contributors. People, they just kind of look for the place that's gonna scratch them where they itch. That's the idea. Some people are like Chuck. They want to set their own agenda of what church should be, of what church should do. They want things tailored and programmed uh, to fit their own desires, to fit their own appetites. And the Bible warned us that this would happen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, which will be part of our series. Paul warns Timothy that a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. People will look for churches like this. Scratch me where I itch, tell me what I want to hear. And so here, in our key text of this entire book, the big idea text, right? Paul tells Timothy, look, Timothy, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Get it? He's saying, this is the church of the living God. This is not the church of Chuck. 
Chuck doesn't get to say, this is the community I'm seeking because it belongs to God. That's the idea. And that's our second point. If you're taking notes, the church belongs to the living God. How many of you have kids? They, they try to act like they own the place. How many of you have kids like that, right? They want to be King Farouk. Just show up and let me... We, we all do, don't we? Our kids, if they, if they, they that's, that's all of childhood is them kind of growing up, wanting to own the place and you telling them you don't own the place. That's kind of what, what childhood works out. I remember my kids, you know, used to come in and, and they, they, would, they would just behave in such a way where every once in a while I'd have to remind them, look, your mom is not your maid and you're not King Farouk. The world, the sun doesn't rise and set on you. You're a member of the family and you've got rules and you've got responsibilities. Why? Because I love them. I want to see them grow up. I want to see them mature, right? And, and God's put me in charge of our house, right? Our house is going to run a particular way. And, and this is the idea that the church belongs to the living God. It's his house. He's decided that he wants his house to operate a certain way. Um, why? Why? Because he loves us, just like you love your kids. Hey, you can't, you can't come in here acting like that, like the sun rises and sets on you. Why? Because you'll ruin them. Those kids are not prepared for life if you let them just have whatever kind of empire they want. It's the same with God. The psalmist said this, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its peoples belong to him. And let me tell you why that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because God loves the world. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. See, God loves the world. He does not love that the world is fallen, but he loves the fallen world so much that he gave his son so that we would be delivered from our fallenness. The Bible makes it very clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ because Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to, to save those who, who were in bondage to sin, right? And so, so this is, this is the, the thing that God operates as an owner of you and of this, of this world in such a way he wants to deliver you. Now, he's not gonna force himself upon you. He gives everybody free will because that's what love does. Love doesn't demand that, hey, I'm gonna insist that you operate a particular way. No, God's gonna say, this is my standard and I set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, but I beg you to choose life, right? This is, this is how God operates, now, as the rightful owner of the church, the living God calls the shots. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, we have this, this interesting story that happens where Jesus asks his disciples a question. And he asks them this. He says, who do men say that I am? And so these guys answer, and they're like, well, you know, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets, some people think you're John the Baptist. And then Jesus says, yeah, but... Who do you say that I am? And at this point, Peter stands up and he says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God, right? You're the son of the living God. By the way, just that should, should spark in you um, that, that we are... the. Paul says, if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, Right? which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth, right? And, and so Peter says, you're the Christ, you are the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, I'm gonna put this ver these verses on the screen for you. Jesus answered him and he said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven and I also say to you that you are Peter, it means a little rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not 
prevail against it. Leave that up for a minute, guys. So, so I, he says, I will build my church. Now that phrase, I will build my church, both the I and the my in Jesus' statement there are written in the possessive singular. And the idea of this is that Jesus is emphasizing that it's his church and he's emphasizing that it's his work right? This church belongs to me and the work that's going to happen within this church, which is within you, within me, within all of us together, it's his work to do. Guys, I I pray you hear this and and I'm going to come right back to my point here. This isn't in my notes, but I just want to emphasize, you know, as we're gathering together, we pray for an hour on Sunday mornings before we, before we begin our, you know, work and getting everything together, before we have our services, we get together, we pray for an hour. This is the first Sunday of the new year. I'll tell you what's common in the new year, that we get people who say, man, I need me some church. I need me some God right? And it's a mixture of people. Sometimes it's people who, who really haven't been walking with the Lord. All they know is that my, my life needs something right now. Maybe it's God, okay? If that's you this morning, God bless you. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Some of you, you're like, I, I know who, who Jesus is. I've been walking with him, but I kind of got off track. I need to get back on track, and I need to get walking with the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is great. What, what, what I want to introduce you to, what I want to welcome you to as you're here this morning, as you're seeking after the Lord, I want to welcome you to a relationship with the living God. I do not want to welcome you to a religion of do good and try harder. That's not what this church is about. That's certainly not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about Jesus doing a work that you can't do. He promises that, you know, the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new Creation, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. This is God's work to do in us. And so, so this, is, this is the thing. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's a possessive singular. It means it's his church and it means it's his work, right? And he will do. He who, the Bible says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Right? Jesus begins the work. Jesus completes the work. He promises to do this work in us. Now, it's true that Peter's nickname, that, that, that Jesus, that the nickname that Jesus gave, gave Simon was Peter. Peter means little rock, right? Now, contrary to popular belief, a lot of people hear these verses in Matthew 16 and 17, where Jesus says, I will build my church or on this rock, I will build my church, right? You're Peter, you're a little rock, and on this rock, I'm gonna build my church. There's a popular belief that when Jesus says on this rock, he's talking about Peter, that he's gonna build his church on Simon Peter. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is talking about building the church on Simon Peter's confession. He's not saying, hey, Peter, I'm gonna build my church on you. He's saying, I'm gonna build my church on your confession. What was Peter's confession? You're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. That's what Jesus builds his church on, the profession that Jesus is Lord and Messiah, the son of God made flesh, come to earth to forgive and redeem mankind, right? And this is the, the, this is the work that God has has endeavored to do. And Jesus said, I will build my church. Now notice what Jesus doesn't say. What Jesus doesn't say to Peter is, I'm gonna build my church on five steps to a better you kind of sermons. He he doesn't say, I'm gonna build my church on hyper-emotionalism where where you can catch a spiritual buzz and you can come in and you you can get all ginned up by elaborate productions and lights and big drums and, you know, and be moved emotionally. He doesn't say that's what he's gonna build his church on. He doesn't say he's gonna build his church on political activism. He doesn't say he's gonna build his church on social justice. What he says is he builds his church on the proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Why? Because none of those other things are gonna save your soul. I wanna read to you in, in several verses from Colossians chapter one. And I, want, and, and, and I pray you, you, you contemplate these words in your, in your soul by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says this to the Colossians. 
God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is our redemption. Our redemption is because Jesus Christ went to the cross and bled for you and me and died for us. And so we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of our sins through his blood is what Paul is saying. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, Jesus uh, for by Jesus, by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And Jesus is before all things and in him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things may have, the, that, uh, that in all things he, Jesus, may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in the Lord Jesus Christ all the fullness should dwell and by Jesus to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, uh, having made peace through the blood of his cross. This is, do not miss this. The gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ is that you can have peace with God. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, right? What's he do? He tempts you to sin, and the moment you sin, he heaps on condemnation and says, you're a loser, you're a blow it, you can't go to God, you better clean your life up if you wanna get to God. And the gospel says, no. God says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls, right? And this is the gospel, and, and so, and, and, what, and, and what redeems us? It's by the blood of the cross. Verse 21, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That is the message that the world needs. The world doesn't need five ways to a better you. The world needs Jesus, right? It's the message that you need. It's the message your kids need. It is the message that, that everything in everyone in the world needs this message and everything else is worthless. Everything else is impotent. Everything else is dead, right? Here's the application. The church belongs to Christ and because the church belongs to Christ, you and me have a duty, right? What, what should our church be? What kind of a church should we be about building, right? Jesus is the builder, but he employs you and me to labor with him. What kind of church should we be about? We have a duty to engage in a church that focuses on the message that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, right? We have to choose wisely. We got to choose wisely. Is this the church that I'm a part of or not, right? Because the Bible warns us that bad company corrupts good character. And so there's lots of churches out there that we can be a part of that really aren't about the proclamation of Christ in him crucified. So, so we have to make sure I've got a duty to be a part of a church that, that belongs to Christ, that preaches Christ. And I have to operate as a church that functions as stewards, not owners. Stewards, not owners. What's a steward? A steward is somebody who, who handles something responsibly that they know doesn't belong to them, right? An owner says, hey, this is mine. I can, do, I can, I can drive this, this car however I want. And, and, and a steward says, no, no, I gotta be really careful. Now, I use that illustration or that, 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 that saying, I can drive this car any way I want because I got a good illustration. A buddy of mine, Paul, goes to this church um, he, he had a Corvette. I, I don't know. I think he sold it, but he had a Corvette and, and he invited me to drive it one day. So I'm driving this Corvette and, uh, and he's, he's like, get on it, man, gas it. And, uh, and I, I wouldn't do it. Why? Well, I didn't want a ticket, right? We were in our hometown here in Temecula. I don't want people seeing me, you know, <laughs> driving, uh, like that. But also, I was very mindful of the fact this is an expensive car and it ain't mine, right? And, and so I didn't want to wrap that thing around a pole, 
You know, I, I want, I, it, it, the car didn't belong to me, so I, so I was very, I wasn't going to drive this thing the way Paul would drive this thing, right? Um, I might have wanted to, but, I, but, but I'm not going to, right? Now, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a choir boy in the way I drive. Some of you have been driven with me, and you know that. I don't want to come across like I'm, you know, some saint with the way that I drive, you can pray for me. That's an area where I got to be a little bit better. But I'm not going to get on it with Paul's car is my point. And the thing is, when we, when we in terms of engaging in church, like what, what church should we be about and how should we function in the church, we got to understand this place belongs to God, right? And so, and so he has a way that he wants us to operate as as, as Members of the church. And again, when you hear the word church, I want you thinking you. I want you thinking family, right? Just as your home and your family and you know how you want your kids to act and you know how you want, you, you know, you, husband and wife, you want to react to one another and, you know, in a way you want to, you want your household to operate in a certain way. And this is the way it is with God. And so we have to come into it understanding, look, we're, we're stewards, we're not owners, Paul says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And so Paul says, number one, God designed the church to operate in a specific way for a specific purpose. Number two, he says that the church belongs to the living God, right? So specific way, specific purpose, this determines what the agenda of the church should be. The church belongs to the living God. This determines what governs what the conduct of you and me within the church should be. Thirdly, he says, the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, with my remaining time, what I want to do is I want to unpack these three words here. The pillar, the ground of truth. So we're going to look at pillar, we're going to look at ground, we're going to look at truth. The word truth that he says there, in the Greek, it's the word aletheia, and here's what it means. It means literally what is true in any matter under consideration. What Paul says is, look, the church is the pillar in the ground of the truth. And when I say truth, I mean the truth, like true in any situation, under any matter under consideration. The idea of verse 15 is that God's house is the place where truth is distributed. And this is important because there has been a war on truth from the beginning of time. There's a war on truth, right? Speaking to the Pharisees in John chapter 10, Jesus warned this. He said, the thief does not come except, except to steal and to kill and to destroy. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So the thief that Jesus is talking about here, he's talking about Satan, who is also called in the Bible the father of lies. And Jesus said he's a murderer and the truth is not in him because he hates the truth. And we've seen this from the beginning. You know, you go all the way back to the garden. And, and Jesus had placed Adam and Eve in the garden and Satan shows up and he's like, hey, you know, why don't you eat of this fruit? The, the, and, and she's like, well, yeah, God told us not to eat of that. He said, in the day we eat it, we're gonna surely die. And Satan, he's like, no, nah, you're not gonna die. God's just holding out on you. God just doesn't want you to be like him because he knows in the day you eat of it, you're gonna be like God. God's trying to withhold something good from you. And this is the way that Satan operates to this day. He takes God's word, he twists it, he manipulates it, he sows seeds of doubt, and he basically insinuates that, listen, God's word, it's not what's best for you. That, 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 that there's things, there's desires that you have that, that this isn't you know, gonna, gonna accomplish, gonna achieve, whatever it is. And so what happens is that he substitutes the lie for the truth. And what Paul says here in 1 Timothy 3.15 is that the church is the ground and pillar of the dissemination, the distribution of truth. This is the place God designed and established to refute Satan's lies. Which is why, by the way, Paul told Timothy, we will get here again, we'll, we'll unpack this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. He tells Timothy, look here as the pastor of this church, preach the word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For, he says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, we've read this, right? Because they have itching ears, they're going to heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and they're going to be turned aside to fables, right? And, and so we need, to, we need to understand that. That, that there is a desire to hear what we want to hear and that the church has a duty and responsibility to say, no, the truth is what we stand on. This is the place that we need to distribute the truth. This is why we don't preach messages on five ways to a better you. This is why we don't deviate from, you know, the, the, the anchoring compass of God's word and start delving into the things of this world to, to say we're going to preach about, you know, politics this week or we're going to teach about, you know, social justice this week or whatever it is. No, we're going we're gonna to teach the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Why? Because this this is where it's at. Listen to what Paul, Paul says again to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, translated your Bible, all scripture, it's given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine. That means it's profitable to tell us what's right. It's profitable for reproof. That, that means to tell us what's wrong. It's profitable for correction. This is, hey, this is how you get right because you're not right right now. It's profitable, Paul says, for instruction in righteousness, that's how to stay right, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so this is what we're to be and to do as a church. We're to be a place that, and a people that comes and says, God's word is, is that compass that I need to be aligned to. And I spend the entire week being saturated and bombarded with lies. And what I do is I come to God's word to orient me correctly. I've told the story before, but, I, but years ago I had a, a little boat, 18 foot boat. I used to take it over to Catalina all the time. And, and you know, when you go over there, you can't see the island when you, when you get, you know, a little ways offshore. Um, you know, you can't see the island most of the time when you set out, right? And so you go, and then what happens ultimately, nine times out of 10, is you get about halfway across and you look back and you can't see the mainland either. So you're just out there in the middle of the ocean. And it's really easy to get off course. I had, I had a little compass there in my boat and, uh, and I would, you know, I'd be going across this is before GPS, right? So it's just me and the compass. And, uh, and I, what I noticed is, like, if I didn't pay attention to the compass, it, really quickly, we were off course, right? And, and, and God help me, if I didn't have that compass, like, I'd be completely lost. And so, you know, you got you to orient yourself on, on the compass or, or you get lost. And, uh, and, and so, 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 you know, hey, you take my dad across there. He's like, hey, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> no, I'm not. The compass says I'm going the right way. And he says, I can feel it in my bones. You're going the wrong way. I said, look, we're going to keep going. I, you know, I got lots of gas. If I, if I get below a half a tank of gas and we, ain't, we haven't seen, you know, the, the island, I'll turn around. We'll go back. And sure enough, the island comes into sight. My dad's like, doggone, I could have sworn the island was over there. That's the way it is for you and me. We go through our, we go through our week and, and, and it's just the, the, the fog of life sometimes or the lies of the world, the lies of our flesh. There's, a, there's just an unholy trinity that, that exists in the world. You know, God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the, the holy trinity. There's an unholy trinity, which is the world system and the, the satanic, demonic realm and your own sinful flesh. And all three of these things lie to you to get you off course. And we come to God's word and we come together to God's word and we say, this is the compass where I'm going to get focused. I'm going to get reoriented. And so Paul says, look, the church is to be that place where the truth, the, the compass heading of God is, 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 is disseminated. The second and third words done back here are, are these words, ground and pillar. I told you when we began that the people of Ephesus were very spiritual, Hollywood kind of spiritual, right? They worshiped dozens of gods, but <clears throat> one of the main gods that they worshiped was the moon goddess Diana. And in Ephesus, at the time of this writing, there, there, there was this massive temple of Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. 
Uh, it stood almost 200 feet tall. It was anchored by a massive foundation, and it was supported by 56 giant pillars. And each one of the pillars had been dedicated and, and uh, given to this, this, uh, this construction of the Temple of Diana by different kings. And so they were, you know, decorated with gold and ornate jewels and all of these things. And <clears throat> here in verse 15, when Paul says that the church is the ground and the pillar of truth, understand that word ground in verse 15, in the Greek, it literally means a building foundation. And, and that word pillar literally means a supporting column. And so when Paul here speaks about foundations and pillars, these, these, these Ephesians would have known exactly what he was talking about. They would have had, you know, this picture of this massive foundation, you know, temple built on this massive foundation with these ornate pillars. And the idea here is Paul's using that as an object lesson. Something they see every day to, and he's visually illustrating for them the spiritual truth that Jesus' church stands upon the firm foundation of the word of God and that everything Jesus' church builds is supported by immovable pillars, right, of his word. Jesus told a parable in Matthew's gospel. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and they beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone, he said, who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, <coughs> and they beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." Now, in this parable, the house that Jesus talks about is not a literal house. It's a metaphor for your house, the house of your life. And the idea is that everybody, everybody builds their life on something, right? Some people build their life on their possessions, right? Everything's founded on what can I get? Some people, they build their life on pleasures and everything's founded on what makes me happy. And some people, they build their life on people and everything's founded upon who is it that's going to make me happy. Some people build their life on accomplishments and, and everything is founded upon what is it that I can achieve? Because, because whatever it is that I achieve, whatever it is that I accomplish, this is, this is you know, going to define who I am. So I'm going to build my whole life on this thing that drives me. And, and listen, understand, in and of themselves, the, these things, they aren't necessarily bad in your life. But they make a lousy foundation to build your life upon. There's a massive difference, right? Why? Because Jesus says storms are coming that are gonna beat against the house of your life. And some of you know this. Some of you maybe are in a storm right now. Maybe that's why you're here. Because you're going through a storm and you're thinking everything in my life is blown away. And I need something to hold on to. And the thing is, is that these storms come and they beat upon your life. And the truth about the storms of life is that they shipwreck our possessions. They shipwreck our pleasures. They shipwreck our relationships. They shipwreck our accomplishments. And if those are the things that you've anchored your life upon, they shipwreck you. This is what we need to know. And so what's the answer to the inevitable storms of life that we face? Jesus says our lives have to be anchored and built Upon his word, this is what he's saying. Hebrews 6.19 says, the hope of God's word is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Listen, as we close, understand the church is the place that God designed where that truth is proclaimed and where that truth is distributed. A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, said this, the Christian that is bound by his own horizon, the church that lives simply for itself, is bound to die a spiritual death and sink into stagnancy and corruption. 
We can never thank God enough for giving us not only a whole gospel to believe, but a whole world to give it to. The church, it is the foundation and the pillar of truth. That's why we exist, the proclamation of the truth of God's word. We're gonna unpack this truth through as we go through First and Second Timothy, and we're gonna see how we live in this life. But for today, let me close with four questions. Question number one, ask yourself this. And then we, we, we ask you these questions like maybe we'll put this up at the end of the service to you and take a picture of it. This is something we want you to take a walk with this week prayerfully. <coughs> so number one, ask yourself, how do I behave in God's house and what behaviors need attention this year? Second question, what foundation and pillars have I been building my life upon? So easy as Christians to go, yeah, God's word is the foundation and pillar of truth, the foundation and pillar for our life. Like, we, that's what I got to build upon. And we can hear a truth, but we cannot do the truth, right? Not live out the truth. So we have to go, you know, this, we know that this is true. This is the foundation pillar, but are, is there another foundation, another pillar I've been building upon? Question number three, what lies have I or do I believe that adversely impact my life? And here's the fourth question. What hinders me from hearing and believing the truth of God's word to set me free in those areas? Mm -hmm.